Hi, I'm Bruce Garrick of Wargamespace.com. You know, for the longest time, war games were associated with hexagons. And there's a good reason for that, too. And using a grid of hexes instead of squares was a way to say that you were serious about simulating reality and you were going to start out by having everything be able to move in all directions equally. After all, remember, that time, graph paper was a specialty product. And hex paper? That didn't really even exist. So making a game with hexes instead of squares was a way of saying, hey, I'm going to do this the hard way. Obviously, the hobby's changed a lot since then. But in the history of simulation gaming, overcoming the so-called hex bias is an important part of what let us develop as a hobby. So much of what was once controversial has gotten lost, so that we often don't credit game designers with important ideas as much as we should. I'd like to try to fix a little bit of that. Early war games were all about trying to represent military events as closely as possible, and while the very earliest games, like Tactics and Tactics 2, used square grids, whether by land or by sea, the hex map quickly became de rigueur for any serious game. Even by air, Air Wars hexes formed a 12-point facing system that allowed for the creation of the most detailed air combat game ever devised prior to the era of computer flight simulators. Hexes were incredibly versatile things. This meant that any game that didn't use hex grids was open to suspicion. I think area movement gaming stigma is best demonstrated by a game called War at Sea. Now this was published by Jedco Games in 1975 and then a second edition published by Avalon Hill in 1976. And it got the nickname Dice at Sea because, well, you do roll a lot of dice. But I think this obscures the fact that although it's not a good simulation, and that's not because of the system, just because, well, the order of battle had to be speculative in order to keep it from being completely unbalanced. In my opinion, it's actually a pretty good game. But it's definitely not hardcore. And at that time, a game actually had to be hardcore to be accepted as a war game. While there are plenty of games with hexes that did just as bad a job, or worse, at accurately simulating their historical subjects, Area movement games seemed to suffer from an association with games like Risk and Axis and Allies, which were felt to be games about war without being war games. In 1981, Courtney Allen designed Storm Over Arnhem, the game that simulated part of a famous battle, the heroic last stand of the British First Airborne at Arnhem during Operation Market Garden, which was popularized 30 years after the event by Cornelius Ryan's bestseller, A Bridge Too Far. The Battle for Arnhem Bridge took place in a relatively small area, which lent itself to precise and exacting recreation. But instead of laying down a hex grid over the battlefield, Allen used area movement. Allen even anticipates some of these complaints in his designer's notes. He argues that area movement actually leads to a more realistic depiction of terrain, stating that, what may not be so obvious is the detailed analysis that went into the design of each rule section. Much of the ability to use exact terrain came from the fact that the game uses areas, rather than the traditional hexagonal grid, to regulate movement in combat. Rather than having to distort the terrain to conform to a hexagonal grid, as is done in most simulation games, the areas were drawn to fit the actual terrain. Notice how he throws in that distort the terrain bit. That didn't prevent people from calling Storm over Arnhem crap in letters to the editor of the Avalon Hill magazine The General. Storm over Arnhem was anything but crap, and in fact, won the Charles S. Roberts Award in 1982 for Best 20th Century Board Game. And although the historical situation doesn't lead to a very dynamic game, the sheer menu of options makes it very difficult to decide on just one thing to do. The Storm over Arnhem map is composed of areas which, according to Courtney Allen, were determined to a large extent by the city block configuration, lines of sight, and areas of maximum exposure. These are surrounded by a perimeter of off-map zones. 
five years later, Courtney Allen took his area impulse system to an unusual battle, the Third Battle of Monte Cassino. This required a number of changes to the system, as well as a map with two different scales, but the essential elements of the game were preserved. In the designer's notes to Thunder at Casino, Allen was even more direct. Many gamers have this thing about hexes. They tend to look down their noses at area movement games. If it hasn't got hexes, it can't possibly be realistic. Balderdash. A hex grid is nothing more than a common measure of area or range. If superimposed over a map without consideration for the consequences of the terrain it dissects, a case can easily be made that it is a less realistic format for the display of a battlefield than a carefully constructed area movement map. Do you get the feeling that there's something going on here? It was 1989's Turning Point Stalingrad, which was designed by Don Greenwood using many elements of Allen's impulse system, that really polished the system to an impressive level. And the last Avalon Hill game using the system, 1992's Breakout Normandy, is a tense, balanced game that, in my opinion, is one of the best board war games ever designed. After the demise of Avalon Hill, the area impulse system soldiered on. In 2003, Multiman Publishing released Monty's Gamble, a game about the overall market garden campaign in 1944, of which Storm Over Arnhem was just a part. In 2008, they released Storm Over Stalingrad, and in 2014, Storm Over Dien Bien Phu. Revolution Games has also published two games using the system, the first in 2013 being Operation Battle Axe, a game about the North African campaign in 1941 and the failed British offensive. And then just in 2015, The Siege of Orgun, a game about a battle in Afghanistan in 1983 between the Soviets and the Mujahideen. Now, these games aren't all the same, but they share a basic conceit, and they're much more similar than they are different. Storm Over Arnhem and Thunder at Casino were the first two games in the series, and were designed by Courtney Allen. Due to their scale, they differentiated between fire combat and close combat, and had certain turns explicitly designated as occurring at night. The system underwent an evolution with the next two games, Turning Point Stalingrad and Breakout Normandy, both designed by Don Greenwood, and this was continued by Michael Ranella in Monty's Gamble, published by Multiman Publishing after the demise of Avalon Hill. Greenwood removed the close combat phase, as it was no longer realistic at that scale, and introduced the possibility of turns ending unexpectedly. The later it got in the turn, the more likely the turn was to end. This is probably the biggest difference between these games and the other games in the system, and is a big part of what makes these games so good. The system got a major revision with the next game, Storm Over Stalingrad, and Storm Over Yin Bien Phu used the same revised rules. The turns once again had a fixed length, there was no tactical advantage to consider, and only the attacker rolled dice in combat, making it much easier to calculate the chances of success. They also introduced card play, making this a significant departure from the system to that point. Siege of Organ from Revolution Games uses almost the same system, with the difference that both attacker and defender roll one die each, reducing the variance from the first five games. While these games were both preceded and followed by hex-based designs covering these same battles, it was designers like Courtney Allen and Don Greenwood who made area movement acceptable long before it became fashionable. That's an awful lot of wargaming history to consider, but I strongly feel that when we critique new games, we should really take time to understand where they're coming from. We might just find a big piece of wargaming history staring us right in the face. Storm Over Dien Bien Phu was released by Multiman Publishing in 2014 and contains rules, a single large map sheet, 176 counters, and a set of 54 cards, 27 for the Viet Minh and 27 for the French. The map is a functional and attractive single 22 inch by 34 inch space that's long and narrow in keeping with the layout of the Dien Bien Phu position. It stretches from Gabriel in the north, down past the main airfield, the central strong points, and southward. The strong point is a buh. It should eventually get to Strong Point Isabel. Where is it? Whoops, sorry about that. Uh, seem to have lost Isabel. Maybe 
gets in here. No. Uh, Could have gone in here, maybe. Let's see. No. No. Um, maybe it's in here. I don't know where Isabel went. Ah, yes, Isabel. The southernmost strong point, shown here in an aerial recon photo, was quite separate from the main position. The rest of the French strong points were in the center and north, while Isabel was almost four miles away to the south. And while it held out until the end of the battle, it was isolated after a time and didn't play much of a role except to provide artillery support. The decision to exclude Isabel entirely is pretty brave. And I'm ordinarily a big fan of trying to solve difficult gaming problems in novel ways. Removing Isabel from the map allows you to solve the problem of its effect on the overall geometry of the battle, and can kind of be justified by saying, well, nothing much really happened in that part of the battlefield during the battle anyway. The problem is that Isabel is so closely associated with the battle in multiple ways, as is its particular overall geometry, that when you remove it, you're really losing a lot of historical flavor. And when you have a game that's this bland, you're probably going to be sorry that you left out that bit of seasoning. Storm over Dien Bien Phu is played at the company level. If you compare this to Citadel and La Vallée de la Mort, you'll find that a French battalion, like the 3rd Battalion of the 13th Foreign Legion Demi Brigade shown here, is composed of four units in the former, while the latter represents it as a single counter. The Viet Minh Battalion, on the other hand, is three units in Storm over Dien Bien Phu, while the previous two games we looked at both used single counters for this. You'd think that this would lead to an overload of Viet Minh units, but unlike Citadel, and to a slightly lesser extent La Vallée de la Mort, in which the Viet Minh had lots of artillery, and the French had their aircraft, artillery, and tanks, Storm over Dien Bien Phu has none of this. What it does have is some paratroops. And some, uh, I guess those are Moroccans. And then, um, Algerians, although they're the same. And, okay, ties, yeah, they're orange. And oh, even a couple of armored units. On the Viet Minh side, we've got an elite infantry company, a regular infantry company, another um, regular infantry company with some different historical numbers on it, yet another regular infantry company with a cool red circle number instead of a black boxed one. But those are just setup aids, so they don't factor into gameplay. And this faceless replacement. Storm over Dien Bien Phu tries to offload a lot of historical flavor onto the cards. There are cards that mimic historical events, cards that tweak the mechanics, cards that respond to the other player's cards, and cards that incorporate factors like air power and artillery that the designer chose not to depict directly on the map. But this still leaves us with a big problem. A big part of historical wargaming is evoking the period you're trying to recreate. Some designers know this intuitively. In Kevin Zucker's Napoleonic opus, The Coming Storm, how many players can't immediately tell which units represent the French Imperial Guard? In Dien Bien Phu, you have one of the iconic military units of all time in the French Foreign Legion, and you make it indistinguishable from some colonial troops? Kim Kanger shows how this is done in his masterpiece of a design, Dien Bien Phu, The Final Gamble, which uses counter art beautifully and evocatively. So what's this stuff? Part of the problem stems from the changes made to the system after Monty's Gamble, starting with Storm over Stalingrad. Previously, only the attack factor of the strongest firing unit was used to calculate the attack value, with each additional firing unit only contributing one strength point each. Now, with all units contributing their total firepower factor to the attack value, the overall factors have to be decreased, or you overwhelm the system. Unfortunately, this dilution homogenizes all the units without gaining a concurrent design benefit. In Storm over Dien Bien Phu, the card system is nicely integrated into the historical situation. The French maximum hand size depends on control of two different sets of three areas each, the first of which represents the perimeter strong points, and the second of which represents the main airfield. Thus, the French tactical flexibility decreases as their perimeter shrinks. Each area also has a terrain modifier associated with it, but there is no explicit terrain type depicted. 
From a presentation standpoint, it's all very clean. The clean presentation extends to the counters. Since unit type is irrelevant in the game for both practical and aesthetic reasons, all you need to know is that units have an attack strength, a defense strength, and a movement factor. The front side of the counter is called its fresh side and makes it eligible to take an action during a turn. Once it has done so, it is flipped to its spend side, which just displays a reduced defense strength and cannot move until it is flipped back to its fresh side, which is usually the next turn. Players alternate impulses in which they activate some or all of the units in a single area to move or fire. They do so until they either have no more fresh units to activate or the two players have passed consecutively. Then play proceeds to the next turn. Now after that, all I need to do is tell you how to do combat and you can play the game yourself. Fire combat takes place either between units in adjacent areas or units in the same area. In this example, the Viet Minh units in Area 34 will fire on Area 33. First, all the attack factors of the firing units are added. Here, that's 9. This is compared to the highest defense strength in the area being attacked, and that's 8. Since the attack is coming from an adjacent area and not from within the same area, the terrain modifier is added to the defense for a final total of 11. Now you roll two dice to determine casualty points inflicted. Add the final attack strength to a roll and subtract the defense strength and you have the result. If it is greater than zero, the defender must absorb that many casualty points. Casualty points are a combination of flipping units over, retreating them, and eliminating them. Eliminating a fresh unit is three casualty points. Eliminating a spent unit is two casualty points. Flipping a unit from fresh to spent or retreating a spent unit is one casualty point. Fresh units must be flipped to spent to retreat, so flipping and retreating a previously fresh unit is two casualty points. Since the Viet Minh units have fired, they have to be flipped to their spent side. Once that's done, it's time to roll two dice for the combat resolution. The die roll here is six. Yep, that smells like a six, so that's approved. 9 plus 6 equals 15, minus 11 equals 4 casualty points. The French could eliminate one fresh unit for 3 points and flip the other unit to spent and stay in area 33. But instead, to preserve their force, they will flip and retreat both units, which also adds up to 4 casualty points. While area 33 is now empty, the Viet Minh units that are fired are done for the turn, so they can't move in, and the French could use their next impulse to move another unit in. If they don't, the Viet Minh will need to find a unit from elsewhere on the map to take control. I forgot to mention one important thing. Assaults. And trenches. Two things. At the beginning of the historical battle, the Viet Minh employed human wave tactics to overrun the outlying French strongpoints. The French were stunned, but the Viet Minh were decimated. They took tremendous casualties, and this led to a lull in the battle as they shifted to digging trenches up to the French positions. It was siege warfare along the lines of World War I. In the game, the Viet Minh can also build trenches. They do so by flipping two units from fresh to spent in an area for each trench level they build in that area, up to a maximum of level 3. This is essentially a time sink for the Viet Minh to slow down the tempo of combat, as was the case historically, as units are used for digging instead of fighting. The Viet Minh cards also all have numbers on them, which allows the Viet Minh to build a trench level equal to the number of the card in an area instead of having to use units, although at the expense of not being able to use the card for its printed effect. Trenches serve two purposes. They increase the defense level of the area up to a maximum of three, and they also are a requirement for the Viet Minh to launch an assault from that area instead of just using it for fire combat. Assaults are a special game mechanic to allow the Viet Minh to enter an area after combat using the units that fought in that combat. The French are not allowed to use the terrain modifier on defense, but if the area is not completely cleared by the assault, the assault fails and the units stay in the area they were assaulting from. Either way, one of the assaulting units is eliminated. The requirement to have a level 3 trench in the area launching the assault is waived on the first game turn to reflect the Viet Minh's initial disregard for casualties. Originally, I was going to play a demonstration game so I could demonstrate exactly how the rules work in practice. But I was able to find two of the original historical combatants to play the game against themselves, so I thought I'd do that instead. For the French, I have Major Marcel Bruno, 
Bijard of the French Airborne. Marche ou crève. And for the Viet Minh, I got Uncle Ho himself, Ho Chi Minh. Anyway, I thought it would be best if these two experienced generals fought the game between themselves while I sat back and commented. That way, I wouldn't be stuck playing a solitaire game against myself to explain the rules. It's not immediately clear from the map presentation, but the two most vulnerable French strongpoints are Beatrice and Gabrielle, just as they were historically. But you don't get a sense of this from the way the map is laid out, because thanks in part to the omission of Isabel, the whole French position seems pretty compact. Ho Chi Minh starts out by sending the entire 209th Viet Minh Regiment to assault strongpoint Beatrice, as he did historically during the non-cardboard portion of our world history. As we learned before, an assault is an attempt to take an area by some combination of destroying defenders and forcing them to retreat. Assaults are usually not allowed except out of a level 3 trench, but there is an exception on turn 1 to simulate the Viet Minh human wave tactics at the beginning of the battle and their disregard for casualties. Assaults are risky though, because if they fail, the Viet Minh lose a unit from the assault force. The 209th Regiment has three battalions and nine companies, all with a strength of one each. That's a basic attack strength of nine. All of the French units in the area under attack have a defense of nine. Since the defense value of an area is based on the single strongest unit, that makes this easy. The final casualties will be the attack value plus a die roll minus the defense value. If this were fire combat, the French could take advantage of the area's terrain effect modifier of three, but in an assault, terrain modifiers are ignored. That's an 8. 9 plus 8 equals 17. Subtracting the French defense value of 9, the French need to come up with 8 casualty points. It's an interesting choice. The French can hold on to Beatrice if they're willing to sacrifice two foreign legion companies. Eliminating a fresh unit is 3 casualty points, so eliminating 2 gets you 6, and flipping the remaining 2 units to spent brings you up to 8. But the Viet Minh have another regiment adjacent and ready to finish what the 209th started, and anyway this would destroy half of a foreign legion battalion on the very first impulse with the rest soon to follow. The French can, however, avoid any permanent unit losses and retreat all four units to Area 17. This would add up to 8 casualty points, since they would satisfy 1 point each for the flip to their spent side and 1 point each for the retreat. Four units flipping and retreating is 8 points. The 3rd Battalion of the 13th Foreign Legion Demi Brigade escapes to Area 17. Since the area was under assault and was cleared of French units, the Viet Minh can now enter the space. All the assaulting Viet Minh units are flipped to their spent side and will not be able to do anything else on this game turn. The Viet Minh are finished with their move and thus their half of the impulse comes to an end. Now it's the French impulse. Instead of moving or attacking with units, Major Bigard decides to play an artillery card which executes a fire mission with seven attack factors on any area adjacent to a French-controlled one. He chooses Area 7, as its units are in position to assault Strongpoint Gabriel. Because the firing units are not in the same space as the defenders, and it is not an assault, the Viet Minh gain the benefit of the terrain, which is just plus one. Against the seven attack, the Viet Minh have a defense of nine. Sacre bleu! A four. 4 plus 7 is 11, and against a defense of 9, that is just 2 casualty points. The Viet Minh simply flip 2 units to their spent side. They still have plenty of units in Area 7 to cause trouble later. Now it's the Viet Minh impulse, and Ho Chi Minh decides to assault Strongpoint Gabriel, another historical move. He has the elite 88th Infantry Regiment of the 308th Infantry Division. This regiment has several battalions with elite infantry companies, and its attack strength is a whopping 12. Since the French don't get the terrain bonus in an assault, the French defense is only 8. Ho plays a further trick by using a night assault card, which would add 3 to the attack factor to a total of 15, but Bijad cleverly counters with a flare card, which cancels it. Ouch! A 10! 10 plus 12 is 22, minus 8 is 14. The French have to eliminate 14 casualty points. 
They only have five units, which total 15 casualty points in total. The French have to eliminate four fresh units for a total of 12, and then flip and retreat a fifth unit, which adds up to 14. The French hand is down to two cards. One allows a reroll of a French attack, but the French aren't going to be making any attacks just yet. The other card is for reinforcements from Isabel, so at least that strong point isn't totally forgotten in this game. The French can get up to two units depending on the die roll. A four. That's good for an armor unit to be placed in area 38. It's back to the Viet Minh for their next impulse. Hey guys, guys, guys. Ho, oh, why are you building trenches? I mean, yeah, I know it's in the rules, but you took zero casualties in the first turn without having any trenches at all. Why would you waste your time building them now? And that's my biggest problem with Storm Over Dien Bien Phu. It feels like a system being put onto a situation. Let me show you what I mean using a game called Assault, published by GDW and designed in 1983 by noted game designer Frank Chadwick. It's a contemporary tactical combat game depicting fighting between US and Soviet troops as it would have been circa 1985. It uses a command point system that's somewhat cumbersome but does reflect the differences in abilities between the two sides very well. The Soviets usually have fewer command points relative to the US, and in a system in which these units generate the command points that permit movement in combat, this can be very restrictive for the Soviets. To mitigate this, Chadwick designed a Soviet battle drill rule, which allows the Soviets to issue commands to large numbers of troops at once, as long as all those troops do exactly the same thing. You can imagine how dangerous it might be to respond to a threat by giving all the units in a large formation the same order, even if only a few of those units are close to that threat. But the thing is, there's no requirement to do this. You can give orders any way you want. The only thing is, as the Soviets, you're going to leave a lot of units standing around if you don't use battle drill. But that's up to you. It's your choice. There might be situations in which this makes sense. Frank Chadwick has a paragraph in his designer's notes, which I think is worth quoting its entirety. One advantage of the command control system in the game is that it enabled me to avoid writing straitjacket rules for the Soviet player to reflect correct doctrine. Given the relative number of HQ and TOC units available, Soviet doctrine comes naturally. Soviet units tend to move in formation in the attack. They will stay in column, or march formation, as long as possible switching to line only at the last minute to carry out an attack. All of these practices make sense for the Soviet player in game terms. I prefer this sort of treatment from a game point of view, as it is not only instructive for the player, he does X because it makes sense, rather than because the rules say he must do X, but also has always seemed more satisfying from a play point of view. I find it very frustrating when game rules arbitrarily require me to play dumb. But playing them is exactly what Storm Over Dien Bien Phu forces the player to do. A better design, in my opinion, would be to force the player into the historical decision. Keep trying to overwhelm the French using frontal assaults, as the Chinese advisors were urging, or switch to a slow investment of the French position using trenches and night assaults. Want to keep hammering away at the French? Go ahead. It might work. But you also might pay the price. But you won't pay the price in Storm Over Dien Bien Phu, because there's no gameplay outcome to penalize you, as you'll find out on the first turn when your assaults go just fine without any trenches at all. Instead, the game forces you to play dumb because, well, that's what the rulebook requires. Storm Over Dien Bien Phu does a nice job in some areas, including its handling of air and artillery by making its availability uncertain and its effects unpredictable, which is much better, I think 
and the way that these were treated in either Citadel or La Vallée de la Mort. And the playing time is very reasonable. I've played the game a half dozen times now, and none of the games, even against opponents new to the system, took more than three and a half hours. But overall, the game just feels like it could be any siege, and the only reason I associate it with Dien Bien Phu is that it says so on the box. Oh, and who won the battle between Major Bijard and Ho Chi Minh? Let me just say that in all the games that I've played, I've never seen a French victory. And now I can say the same thing for all the games that I've watched that were played by two historical personalities. For our final episode, we'll take a look at what might be not just the best Dien Bien Phu game I've played, but the best war game, period. Until then, we'll see you next time. And thanks for watching.